All right, we're going to begin today's uh, Christmas lesson, believe it or not. And uh, this is really unusual. I don't think I've ever seen them take this uh, particular passage as a Christmas uh, message, but it's a good one. Um, we're in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Uh, if that seems like an odd place to be for the Christmas message, uh, it, it probably is. I don't think I've ever had this as a Christmas message before in terms of you know, study guide uh, for a Sunday school or a Bible study. But we're in John. Uh, we're going to be looking particularly at verses uh, 10 and on up through, I think, 18. Uh, John is, a, as we said before when we were studying the Gospels, is an unusual Gospel in that it's unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are often called the Synoptic Gospels because they typically see things through one view, if you will. Um, that's why they're called synoptic. In Greek, that's one eye. Um, but John is different. Um, John begins differently, and uh, his, his theme is different. Uh, if we look at Matthew and Luke, those are usually where we go for the Christmas events uh, because they talk about the nativity, they talk about the birth of Jesus. Um, Mark doesn't do that. Mark jumps right into Jesus' ministry. Um, but John takes a different tact, and yet it's still a Christmas message. Whereas Matthew and Mark are concerned about the, uh, the kind of human events surrounding the birth of Jesus, John, because he's writing uh, with a theme of Jesus as God, takes an entirely different tact. And yet at the same time, it's a very valid way to approach the Christmas message. Uh, verses 1 through 18 in John are often called the prologue to John. Uh, prologue meaning this, this is coming first, we're kind of setting the stage, we're going to give you the theme, then we're going to go into the details you know, in the, in the following chapters. Uh, John also presents uh, Jesus, again, in a way that the others don't. Um, as God, and I want I'm, Doug. Would you mind doing some reading for us this morning? No, no. no. You okay? Sure. Uh, I would like for Doug just to read for us the the first um, nine verses coming out of the Gospel of John um, to uh, to kind of get this started. I want you to listen very carefully to the way that John begins talking about Jesus in those verses one through nine, and then we're going to pick up. Uh, basically on our study at verse 10. So what version are you going to read, Dad? Yeah. Uh, this is a NASB. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might through him, all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. When we look at this particular passage, there are several things which John then begins to develop in his, uh, in his gospel. Um, the book of John is really a book of contrast. If you read the entire gospel, you'll find that he's constantly contrasting light and dark, um, life and death, love and hate, uh, what was above and what is below. Uh, those are, he's always contrasting these, these elements. And at the same time, uh, John also has three major themes, I think we could say, running through it. One is uh, that Jesus presents humanity with many signs. He presented the people that he was dealing with with many signs. There, there are seven sign miracles in John. And really there's an eighth when you go to the post-resurrection period. Um, the, he also uses the word believe over a hundred times, and actually he, he worked, in, in his gospel alone, the word believe is used more often than the other three gospels combined. Um, he also uses the word life 
as a theme. Constantly talking about life. Doug just read uh, one of those passages uh, about, about life and, and, and Jesus being the light of the world and, and, and having life and giving life and um, life not really having any meaning without Jesus. He was there when it was, when it was created, it was created through him. Um, so those are kind of some, some themes that we find in John as well. We begin with verse 10 then with our study today. That's just kind of background information. But we begin with verse 10. So somebody that has a 10, 11, 12, and 13 would like to read that for us. Have those verses handy. He was in the world. I can read it. Uh, we, got, we got a reader here. But we'll catch you next. Is that okay, Tracy? Sure, that's fine. Okay, good. He was, um, he was in the world, and the world was created through him. And yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. Notice that in verse 3 that Doug just read, uh, we find that John says that uh, anything that was created was by him, uh, and if it wasn't by him, it wasn't created. <laughs> in other words, he was the vehicle through which uh, all creation comes. And here again in verse 10, uh, John says uh, that Jesus was in the world, and the world was created through him. And yet, even though the world was created through him, the creation did not recognize the creator. Um, it goes on to say that he came to his own. That is to say, he came to the Jewish people first, and his own people did not recognize him or did not receive him. This is not to say that everyone who was a Jew rejected Jesus. It's to say that in general, as a, as a race of people, as a group of people, um, that the people did not receive Jesus. He, he, he simply was rejected by them. But then in verse 11, he goes, or 12, he goes on to say, but to those who did receive him, because there were some that did, these are the ones to, which, to whom he gave the right to be the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Notice that in verse 10, the people that did not recognize him had no light. There was darkness, and, and, and they, they would not receive the light. They refused to receive the light that Jesus brought. Again, that's one of the, one of the themes we see in, in, in John. Now he goes on in verse 13, and this is a... A statement that can be uh, that can be taken in several different ways. I've done some research this week to try to find out exactly how to kind of interpret this, and there are a couple of different ways that people see this. Uh, in particular, let's read these verses. Or this verse, verse 13 again. Um, Those who were born, notice these are the believers. They were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man. But they were born of God. Now let's look at those three elements very carefully again. First of all, they were not born, these believers were not born of a natural descent. One way of interpreting this that I, I, thought, I found this week says that, uh, that essentially natural descent would be uh, the the marriage of, a, of the seed of a man, the seed of a woman. Uh, in, in a couple places in the Bible we find that it, it talks about the, the seed of the man, the blood of the woman. And uh, this would be the natural descent, the natural birth process. They did not come to God through this natural birth process. The second thing we see here is the will of the flesh. Um, some interpreters have interpreted this simply as sexual impulse. Uh, and the third thing, the will of man, in many cases, in, some, in one case at least, uh, was interpreted as um, a paternity, that is to say that, that the, the fathering of a child. None of these things brought people to God. They came to God through an act of God. Now, another way of looking at these three elements is, first of all, uh, they were not born of natural descent. In some cases we see this is, it, it, this is, uh, particular verse that they were not born of blood. Some people have interpreted this as they were not born 
as or they did not come to God simply because they were born with the blood of a Jew. That is to say, they were they had Jewish blood, therefore they were all going to be saved. They were all going to be godly people. We know, in fact, that was not the case because many Jews failed God. Uh, and, and even at the time of Jesus, they failed God. So one interpreta another interpretation is that uh, those who were born of natural descent, meaning for, these, for this interpretation of the Jews, uh, did, not come, did not come simply because they were Jews. The second thing here, the will of the flesh, is to say that they did not come simply because they desired God. The Bible makes it very clear that you know all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The flesh uh, is evil, right? Flesh. We are born into sin. We we are sinful by our nature, and therefore it's not simply because we desire on our own to come to God. In fact, we are at enmity with God, and and so that's the second kind of interpretation of this. And the third thing, where it talks about the will of man is sometimes interpreted as it's not because somebody else wants you to come to God. Right. Now, My mom or dad wanted this for me, or exactly. Uncle Bill wanted that for you. Or, yes. Yeah. And, or I want you to be saved, Jim. You're right. a miserable human right. being. Right. By golly, right. and I want you saved. Amen. And so it's my will that you be saved. Right. And, and what John is saying here is none of these three things are going to bring you to God. It's not because you were born a Jew. It's not because... Um, you wanted to become a Christian, you know, wanted to believe in God because we really don't want to believe in God on our own. And it's not because somebody else wanted you to become a Christian, to believe in God. None of these things are going to bring you to God. Those who believe in his name do so by an act of God. It is of God that we come to know him. Now this sets the stage for what John is going to be talking about through this entire gospel. This is the reason why Jesus came as a baby. He, he came as an act that God, in his grace, gave to mankind because these other ways of coming to God were never going to get it. They were never going to bring us to God. Right. Not on our own, not because somebody else wants us to, not because we were Jewish by blood, or, <clears throat> if you will, that we have a bloodline of famous Christians. Yeah. None of these things are going to bring us to God. It is God that brings us, it is Jesus that brings us to God. Are we going to talk about the elect today? Uh, no, no. <laughs> not in particular. Good. Good. We can. It's sort of pizza if we do that. It, it kind of repeats it if we we'll do, be yes. here. We should be here a while. Yeah. No, we'll be here a long time if we start that. getting into that. No, but this is a Christmas lesson because, mm -hmm. see, what John is doing here, instead of saying, now, this is Mary's lineage, back to David, and this is Joseph's lineage, back to David, Therefore, Jesus is, you know, a, a, a son of David. He is going to be in the line of David. Rather than do that, the human lineage, what John is giving us here is Jesus' divine lineage. He's giving us the lineage back to God. And that's why John is so unusual and why I think that we sometimes read these words and they're, they're stirring words. Let me say, this is a tremendous, these 18 verses are a tremendous prologue to everything else that we see in John. But it's different than what we find in Matthew and Luke. Uh, and I think that is an important element yeah. for, the Christ, for the Christmas season. Um, any other thoughts or comments on this basic one? Um, Makes you wonder why we didn't see that introduction of Christmas there to, you know, why it surprised us so much. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to note that, you know, it took me a while as a kid or growing up to realize that you know John was not the John he's talking about there uh, in verse six. Yeah. Two different Johns. Yeah. It's important to note that. Yeah. I know the got the Bible tracks the gospel that you hand out, little book you give away. It's the it's the book of John. It's mm -hmm. the best way to introduce a Jew to who God is, who Jesus is. The Word is Jesus, obviously. Yeah. Um, this is the kind of book that you grow up and you read and you think, okay, yeah, I get it, and it just gets deeper and deeper. Yeah. Great book. I, this is the, John is, I think, the, the, the most difficult of the Gospels to come to. Um, for a long time, I, I struggled with John. I, I, and it was just what you said, Jim. It was a, a, I didn't have a deep enough experience to understand what John was trying to say. Yeah. And it's much easier to read Matthew uh, with the teachings of Jesus, or Luke with the, the human aspect of Jesus, than, and Mark, because he's so 
just action packed. You know, those easy. Those are easier to read. John is more difficult to read because he's writing at a higher level. When he calls Jesus the Word, when right. he says the Word was with us, uh, it's an interesting idea. Um, that word. Word, I guess. Yeah, that word. that word, that word, word, word. <laughs> it's so difficult. We need T-shirts that say <laughs> yeah. word. Um, yeah, word. I like. That word in. Um, oh, John. Yeah, Jim, jump in. John, uh, you know, uh, he relies on the simple words, even though it's difficult to grasp uh, in a in a kind of a rhythm rhythm type style, rhythmic. Um, but what he says is in universal terms that that apply to most any time period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. He uh, writes writes some beautiful stuff in here <laughs> that were you know uh, deciphering and uh, it's some there's some beautiful words. Mm -hmm. And but putting. Yeah, I, I, yeah, very going along with that, going along with that, Jim, and what you said previously, Randy. I, I agree. John uh, initially not easy uh, to comprehend and understand, but as we progress in the Book of John, uh, extremely dynamic in love, L O V E, uh, big book of love, big book describing the love that Christ has and the demand from God through Christ and salvation of where that door is to heaven and where the uh, the cornerstone of our faith really dwells. You know, John, as I perceive it through time, and God pray for me, I'm still perceiving, but it's such a wonderful book, the description of Christ. And, and what he says is the open door once we accept him. Uh, the book of John's got a lot of meat in it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's God inspired, right? It's, you know, oh yeah, well it's all inspired, but we see it in different ways in different places in in Scripture, and we see writers coming to Jesus uh, to the uh, to the New Testament in their writings with their own style, with their own um, themes, if you will. Obviously, all given through the through the Holy Spirit. I think I, I'm truly believe, but um, but each in, in an individual way that marks how they approach and how they say things and yet it all is consistent you know notice how uh, John begins this in the beginning where do we find it? Pardon? Yeah, I was just going to say that what we find though is that as John begins his description of Jesus we can harken back to Genesis 1-1 can't we? in the beginning and how does John begin his gospel? In the beginning. What we see in Genesis is the beginning of creation. But what we see in John is really the beginning of eternal life. Of eternity, if you will. But each one begins in the beginning. Um, and I think that's significant. We, we find in the, Old Testament, in the Old Testament the law. The law of Moses. But what we find in the New Testament is, is the gospel. <coughs> is grace and truth in Jesus. Um, and that's not to say they're, they're not melded. They are melded together, if you will, but not in, really until the time of Jesus till we see that full recognition of God and God incarnate through Christ. Other thoughts or comments on this particular section? It always made it easier yeah, for me to may, replace uh, Jesus uh, with the word. Identifier for me, guys. Big identifier. Uh, is what Jesus says in John, you know, where he says, I believe it's uh, John 3, 3. And he said, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, lest a man be born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. And then, of course, we all should be familiar with 3, 16. And then you go to John 14, 3, where Jesus says again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except by me. Uh, those scriptures were so powerful in me making a final determination after salvation to realize that, hey, there really is only one door here. And then through time and application as a believing man in my life, that door just becomes wider. Mm -hmm. 
Let's move on to verses uh, 14 through 15. There are two, just two verses there. Somebody want to read those two verses Tracy. for us? Tracy. Oh, Tracy, I'm sorry. I, I, I forgot you, Tracy. You had a comment there. No, 14 and 15. She's going to read. Oh, That's Tracy. Okay. Can I'll you... be reading out of the... Pardon? Yes, go ahead, please. 14 and 15? Yes. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Let's break this down now. In verse 14, we have that word, word again uh, in the Greek that that would be logos um, in the Greek language uh, logos essentially is a, it's a very difficult word because it's a, a, an insubstantial word in the sense that it doesn't have physical being and yet at the same time it is a, a word that encompasses so much um, in a way, the word word here essentially means in the Greek a, a rational purpose or you might say a divine reason. Um, in some cases you might use the word the mind or wisdom. There are many approaches to this particular word logos. <clears throat> but in each case we're talking about an overarching being, an overarching sense and yet it doesn't have physical substance necessarily. Uh, notice that this thing that does not have physical substance though, in verse 14 says this logos became flesh. So what we have in Jesus is literally the overarching idea, mind, rationale, purpose, put whatever other words you want to use in there as a synonym, we have that in the flesh. We have that now being in a tangible thing, and that is the, the being of Jesus. Um, is it accurate yeah. to say that you can replace Jesus for the word and it'd be the same thing? I mean, is that I mean, is that yeah, inaccurate or I that, think you could. Doug, is it well, safe to do that? Yeah, uh, if you're talking about the Bible, is the word no? Right. The word is not Jesus. Right. But uh, Jesus is the word. But the word is God and Jesus is God, so here we, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's contained very, yeah. in Jesus, yes. Mm -hmm. It's just always aided me to put Jesus where I saw that applied in this book, especially. In the Greek, though, there's, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, very, it's, yeah. really, it's hard to describe exactly right. what it is, because, because the logos is not something, again, you can put your hand on. Uh, it's the spiritual yet, part of the equation here, right? It, it, it is. It, it's. Uh, I don't want to say it's ephemeral because it's not ephemeral. It's real. Right. But it, it's almost as if it's in a different dimension. I hate to use For that sure. word. No, because, I get that. That's. Yeah. You know, it's, it's difficult. But how else do you? How else do we talk about that? We don't. But we have to see that what what the Greeks and and see as something that is wisdom, the mind, the rationale, the purpose, the reason, whatever you want to, other words you want to use. It becomes flesh in Jesus. Right. It isn't flesh really anywhere Until else, then. but only in right. Jesus. Right. Would uh, yep. would a good word for for the word be aspect? It's another aspect of God. Right on. And, and yet it's an all encompassing. Sorry, yes. I'm sorry, I could not hear what you said. Would you mind repeating that again, sir? He's asking you to repeat. Yeah. I said, wouldn't it be good, fair to use the word aspect to describe the word word capitalized in that it's another aspect of God? It's, it's like you say, Randy, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son, right. that, but that's all you. Aspect of God is word. And, and it's all encompassing. Yes. I mean, that's the important yeah. thing is that um, whatever other synonym we try to use, it is an all encompassing 
idea, if you will. Right. And yet it's made flesh in Christ. Now this is important because if we if we go to some of the heresies of the past and say, well, you know, yeah, Jesus was human, but yeah, he he wasn't there was no divinity there. Right. Or if we go the other way and say, well, yeah, Jesus is all divine, but he really wasn't a man like you and I are men. I think the Bible is very clear that he was both. He was. Yeah. And he was God. God is a spirit. And yet the spirit is becomes flesh. So the word an all-encompassing kind of thought or idea, now becomes in flesh, Christ. And what they saw with Christ during the three years of his ministry was God incarnate. I mean, in, in the flesh, if you will. Right. And this is why I think one of the things we, we sometimes want to overlook is that the apostles and, and those who believed in Jesus, not just the apostles, but all those who believed in him, um, saw this nature of Christ, this, this all-encompassing nature of God in Christ. They saw that. Others missed it. But those who saw it came to believe in it. In the Old Testament, we have a kind of a, uh, I guess you'd say, an equal thing. Uh, here he's called the Word. In the book of Proverbs, Jesus is called Wisdom. And Wisdom is spoken of as being you know, personified too, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. And so it, all wisdom comes from God here. All true knowledge comes from God. You know, as Ed was saying, you know, it's, it's uh, the essence of God, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's super. I mean, praise God for all that. Um, I get from the very beginning there that Jesus is God. And then everything else I read, I guess it's from that lens as I go beyond that and I just... <laughs> you know, here we are again. I need to take another step with all this. Well, we, I think we need to understand that God used ordinary men to write His Word. Sure. You know, there's over 50 authors who helped to write 66 books. But yet they all say, through their own way of saying it, everything God wanted them to say. Right, to reveal, right. You know, and, and so all revelation is inspired of God and it's all correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, there, it's inerrant. Uh, because God used frail men and used their way of speaking and writing, but still he got them to say exactly how sure. he wanted it to be said. I believe that. Yeah. Let's go on to verse... Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Truly amazing. Yeah. It's just amazing, you know, yeah. how he chose, uh, if you will, the everyday people to do that. I mean... Uh, and it was all through God that they chose their words the way they did to write uh, to write the Bible. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, it is. Notice it. Yeah, Jim, it really oh. is. Barry, Sorry. go ahead. Oh, Barry, go ahead, please. I was just uh, off of Jim's comment. Yeah, the connector. Remember when I first got saved a day or two ago now, in Earth's terms, anyway. And, and, and that was always a little bit of a stumbling stone for me for, for a number of years is, okay, uh, the Bible, God's Word, okay, he inspired men, like me as a man, uh, to write his truth. Okay. For a while I had this little bit of a, uh, mostly a hidden question, but a question, okay, this, this is men writing this truth to me, uh, should I really buy into it? The only way you do is through daily application towards it. But I think it's so beautiful, Jim and group, is right. why, God, why God did it that way. Is through the entire moment from the 66 books, uh, he intertwined the weakness of man with the strength of him as man's creator. And now I find it so wonderful, like Jim stated. It's so wonderful to see how he connected all this from then till now and us realizing why he did it that way. Because his strength is personified in using us through our man weakness. Yeah, it's amazing. It really is uh, something I never looked at that closely before until right now. I mean, it just kind of gives you goosebumps. You know, one of the things I find interesting about studying the Bible is that while men speak in, in their own language, if you will, they speak in their own 
cadence in their own way, the Holy Spirit directs all of that. And just as important, we don't read the Bible like we read a novel or a, a piece of history, you know, one event after another. Um, but, what, but rather, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. I've described it this way before. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You're looking for pieces that fit together. And the more you study, the more you see that it's not laid out just that easily. You have to study to find the connections. And sometimes we miss those connections. But we, but we still search for the connections from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from one writer to another writer, from one subject to another subject, and we see little things that start to piece together. And it's like a million piece puzzle. We're putting it together. So it doesn't come that easy. You have to, you have to literally work at it. And I think that's one of the reasons why people are so easily dismissive of Scripture, of the Bible, because they want to read like something they're familiar with, and it's not that familiar. You have to apply yourself. It's intimidating. It's intimidating to people sometimes, you know. Absolutely, Jim. I, I totally agree with you. And and for that reason, I think many people are dismissive of it because it is a challenge to understand Scripture. It doesn't come easy, folks. And when, and when you do understand it, it's convicting. Yes, right. indeed. Yes, indeed. It is convicting. You're right. Let's take another uh, look at this verse. Um, it's it says, a, we observe we avoid things like his that. glory and the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, John uses this word truth. Um, first of all, let's talk about grace. Grace is, is something that we don't deserve. Uh, I'm sorry. Mercy is something that we deserve, but we don't get. Grace is something that we don't deserve, but we do get. Um, but let's look at that word truth for just a moment. Um, in the Hebrew, the, the idea of truth has more the idea of, of faithfulness, um, of uh, sureness, uh, trustworthiness. In the Greek, when the Greek word truth is used, that we, we translate as truth, it really has the idea more of what is true as opposed to what is false. What is reality as opposed to what is appearance. And that's a, a, a little different shade, if you will, of those two words, one in the Hebrew, the other in the Greek. And yet they, they really mean, or, or they have an essence which is very similar. And that is um, that God is truth, God is going to give us truth, and Jesus brings both grace, something we get that we don't deserve, but he also brings truth. That is to say, he brings light to the darkness. He brings light, if you will, to that which is false. He brings light to that which has only an appearance but no substance. And so truth, when John talks about truth, he's not using that word lightly. He uses that word in a very real sense uh, that has substance. And John, uh, Jim, you pointed out a minute ago, um, in verse 15, it says, John testified concerning him. This is not John the writer of the gospel. This is John the Baptist, uh, who said, uh, the one coming after me ranks ahead of me. And then he makes this little comment, because he existed before me. Uh, we can go right back to verse 3, that Doug read earlier, uh, that you know nothing was created without Christ. Christ was there at the creation. It was through Christ that things were created. Uh, I think it's, it's Colossians, I think, that says that he holds things yeah. together. Yeah. Uh, without Christ, without Jesus, the entire universe would fall apart. All the creation right. would fall apart. There would be no creation. Is that what the scientists can't say? You know, that neutron can't, they don't know why it stays around the electron. I don't understand any of that. But is it is that accurate to say that? They don't know why the world just doesn't fly off into 800,000 different directions? It's because of the hand of God, wouldn't you say? Or yeah, Jesus it, is really the I here. think absolutely that what Scripture tells us is it is all held together by Christ. Right. And without Christ, there wouldn't have been a creation. And without Him, it doesn't hold together. Uh, scientists are always looking for a cause outside. I don't want to say outside of God. They are looking for a cause, a first essence, if you will, a first cause. But unfortunately, they, all, they look sometimes outside of God. The scripture and science are not at loggerheads. 
science will prove Christianity. It will, it will prove the Bible when it's really, when you dig at it the right way. But if you come to it with a disbelief in God, you're going to find just sure. exactly what you're looking for. You're going to find another way to describe it. And yet, time after time, those other ways of describing the, the, the world fall apart at some point. There are, right, even right now, evolution is really under attack. <laughs> Mathematically, yes. it's impossible. Math, ma mathematicians who really know their, their subject have written that evolution is simply impossible. It, it is uh, statistically impossible. And yet people hang on to it because it is a unifying theory. And, and it, it becomes a basis for a lot of what they do. But, but it doesn't have, if you look at it correctly, I think, and you look at all the facts, it won't hold up to truth. This is a problem with science today. And, and the Bible. And that is that for years, the Bible and science walked hand in hand. Today, they divert and go, to, go in two different paths. You must believe the Bible in faith. You must have faith in the Bible. When you have faith only in science, and you don't have faith in the Bible as well, you're going to end up in a totally different end. You're going to come to a consequence that is totally different than what the Bible leads us to. It should be. It is, but it shouldn't. But it shouldn't be that way. They call it hell. Yes, they do. And unfortunately, I think that's where any, many of, of people who reject God outright are, are going to end up. That's that's very clear. I think. There's one other thing that uh, that uh, John says here, and I kind of alluded to it a moment ago, uh, and that is that Jesus existed before John. John understood that, and he understood that Jesus was as John. The gospel writer is telling us uh, the essence and through Jesus that all things came into being. Without him, they did not come into being. Uh, John understood that, and he understood that he was not prior to Jesus, but rather Jesus was, was prior to him. Although we know that through Elizabeth that John was actually born six months before Jesus. Yes, exactly. And, and that's I think that's what he's contrasting there. Mm -hmm. I'm older than him physically, right. Right. but he's really older than me because yeah. he's eternal. Yeah, he pre-existed yeah. me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something right. interesting yeah. too that yeah. we're begotten. You know, it's, uh -huh. it's not in our translation, but it is in the King James. Right. And it's used in 316 because begotten means unique or genuine. And what it's saying is Jesus is the only one who has the right to call himself, you know, the genuine son of God. And then back in uh, verse 11 when we were reading it, uh, our 12, he says, uh, all who did receive him, to them he gave the right to be children of God. This is talking about adoption. How we are not equal with Jesus. Jesus is our elder brother, but he's the only true son of God. We are sons and daughters of God only by adoption uh, that we come into family through uh, being brought in uh, through, you know, the uh, works of Jesus Christ. And uh, that I think you pointed out sometime in the past, Doug, that adoption is not a second rate oh, no, or a no. second place kind of thing. Adoption, I think you you mentioned that adopted children have more rights, more rights really, mm -hmm. than a natural born child, mm -hmm. at least in our society. Uh, and I think that's important because we we don't come to God as children of God as second place citizens, if you will. We come to God as adopted children of God with all the rights that belong to um, to, the, uh, the, to the children of God. Uh, no, we are not Jesus, and we will never be Jesus. He is God. We are not God. We're co-heirs, though, right? So Absolutely. co -heir. That's a good way to put it. Co-heirs. Uh, but we come with with all the rights that are due to someone who would be the right son of God. Would be the, from the bloodline, from the if you blood, that's it, right. in our yeah. human perspective. Yeah. In, yeah. in Ju Judaism, you could disown a son like a prodigal. Right. But an adopted son, you could never disown. Oh, really? Yeah, that's one of the benefits. An adopted child has, that's what we say, has greater rights than the natural. Right. 
natural born, yeah. Now think about that. Yeah, I, think it's important, I think it's important to identify the bloodline. The bloodline is a spiritual bloodline through salvation, not a fleshly one through earthly birth. Good point. That's a good way to say it. Yeah, it's a good way to say it, Barry. Yeah. Very well, very well said. Let's turn to finally, uh, we have a few minutes left. Verses 16 through 18. Uh, someone want to read those for us? Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. These last few verses in the prologue to the Gospel of John uh, are significant in that they, they point to certain, again, certain themes that John's going to be hitting on as we go through this. Uh, he uses a term here in verse 16, Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. Um, as I was reading this week, there are, there's one interpretation of this, it says essentially that God gives us grace, but if we lingered only on the momentary grace that God gives us, we might begin to, to become proud of that grace, if you will. That grace upon grace is a way of saying we get grace, we need grace, we receive grace, and yet it, we don't linger in that grace because God is continuing to give us grace. He gives us grace for this moment, he gives us grace to essentially deal with a trial or a tribulation. He gives us grace to understand Scripture, and yet we move on. And so there's another grace, an undeserved blessing that comes our way. The next moment, the next day, the next week, the next month, and then we get through that grace and then there's another one that comes. Sometimes it's a similar kind of grace, and sometimes the grace is different. But it's not one grace that just stays with us and that's all we ever receive. We receive grace upon grace, upon grace, upon grace, continuing to receive his grace in a continuing manner. It's not a one-shot affair. It's not one bucket full, that's all you get. Right. Now, true, salvation is a momentary experience in which we are saved by grace through faith. And yet, we have to have that grace on a continuing basis. Our, we would either become so proud that we're saved and so much better than everybody else, or we would simply have that grace for that moment, for that experience, and nothing else. But we don't. We have grace that continues in different ways and at different times for different purposes. And so that grace is a continuing thing, not a momentary, not just, not just a momentary thing, but it's a continuing action that God places us in. Even salvation, though, is grace upon grace because we do have that initial, but that's in the past. We have mm -hmm. been saved. But sanctification, we are being saved. In future, we will be saved from all sin right. when we're with Jesus. Right. And so it takes grace upon grace for as we continue through the Christian life. Exactly. Exactly. And that, you know, that maybe that's just the, the, the plight of mankind. Well said. You know, you don't want to take that for granted and dwell in the grace, kind of as you said, and continue in your way and say, you know, God's got me. He's going to, I got some right. more grace back there to abuse yeah. the, abuse the, the power there, the, the, the grace. Yeah. Uh, and I think sometimes as human beings, we're, we're going to falter. Uh, you know, First John, I, I think, says, uh, that if you think you have no sin, you know, you're a liar. Yeah. Now, we, we are going to sin. We're human beings. We fight sin all the time. Paul said he constantly fought sin. Um, it's going to happen. And yet, for every time we fail, we can ask God for forgiveness. And His grace will come to us in forgiveness, continually. Uh, so we don't want to list, miss that aspect. Notice that as he goes on to verse 17, he says, The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, in Romans, Paul makes a huge distinction between what law is and what grace is. And they're, and they're not the same. Uh, they're, they're different elements, but they are not exactly the same. You know, the law shows us our faults. It shows us our shortcomings. It shows us where we fail. 
and, and we can never, as human beings, totally keep the law. And yet, through grace, we are allowed to enter, if you will, this relationship with God and to come by His grace to come to Him as if we had never sinned. Uh, now, and then we're going to, and then we ask for forgiveness, and grace covers those sins. Uh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's Bob. that's just based upon Jesus' perfect righteousness. Right. Yes, that He kept the law. Right. You know, he, yes, He never sinned. That He uh, was righteous His entire life, and so it's not only the fact that He uh, bore our sins on the cross and then died and was resurrected, but that He lived the perfect life up until the time He was crucified. He's right. the only one qualified good enough to, to be a quality sacrifice, acceptable right. sacrifice. Beautiful. In verse 18, John makes... I have a drink of water. <laughs> in verse 18, um, we see that John says that no one has ever seen God. The one and only Son, who is himself God and is the Father's sight, he has revealed him. Je we think of Jesus as a, 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 a revelation of God, and yet it is Jesus who really reveals God. Jesus reveals who God is through his life, through his teachings, even through his death, burial, and resurrection. He reveals who God is. He is a, a revelation of God, but he is also one who reveals God. Uh, and in Jesus, we literally see God. Remember, you go, go back to Moses in the Old Testament, and, you know, God can't show him himself in all his Shekinah glory. Uh, it would be too much for, for Moses. And yet, in the New Testament, we have Jesus incarnate, God incarnate. And we see in him all of the aspects of God. We see his, his perfection. That's God's perfection. We see his works. Those are, those are, that, is, that is God that we see doing those works. And so in, while, we cannot, while we have never seen God, if you will, in all of his Shekinah glory, what we do see is God incarnate in Jesus. And that is enough to give the disciples and the apostles and those who believed in Jesus and saw Jesus and heard him and walked with him to give them the confidence to go out and do what they did in the early church. This is a message of Christmas, is it? God has come to mankind. He shows himself. He reveals himself. And Jesus, in turn, reveals back who God really is and what God wants and what God is willing to do for mankind. Uh, with Philip that came to Jesus and said, show us the Father and this will be enough. Right. Mm -hmm. and Jesus says, have I been with you so long, Philip, and you've not seen me? Yeah. Because he who has seen me has seen the Father. Yeah. Yeah. I'm That's, the Father of one. And we could all look at those perspectives of, the, of those gentlemen that who were the, 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 the saints of old, the disciples and all. I, I find myself thinking when Randy explained that, where is it in the Bible where it says he came as a regular man? There was nothing beautiful about him. He wasn't exceptional in any particular physical way. Isaiah. Yeah, yeah. 53. Yep, the prophecy. Yeah. That he, you know, he was not... See, I think we sometimes... I mean, he wasn't slick and flashy right, and, you know, right. so none of that. So he, mm -hmm. This is one of the problems. Huh? Just plain old He was a plain old yeah, Jew. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I think we have a tendency to see the Hollywood Jesus. Yeah, yeah. This really good-looking guy, and he's strong, and 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 he can climb and, on a soft shoe. Yeah, he just he you know he do a soft shoe for you yeah. or whatever you know the romantic you know image. Uh, I've been watching this this series, The Chosen. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing. It's free. You can get it on on uh, YouTube. The guy who plays this this, this plays Jesus in this particular drama. Uh, there's eight eight series or eight episodes out. Uh, Jonathan Rumi, he looks like, I think, what Jesus really looked like. He's just a common, everyday guy, looking yeah. guy. There's nothing that you would call your attention to as a Hollywood right. star. Um, he, he, he doesn't have this kind of uh, presence, if you will, like uh, the charisma, if you will. And yet, he has charisma. And you know, when you see him, this portrayal, I, th I, I say to myself, this is probably more like what Jesus looked like than some of these Hollywood actors who are, you know, who have this beautiful face and they have this way of moving and everything. Right. He is so natural. And I think that is what Jesus really was. And Doug, you're right. He, he was a Jew. Mm -hmm. He looked like a Jew. 
He didn't look like some medieval, you know, depiction a depiction uh, of Jesus as again a Hollywood star. Superman, Just wasn't the case. Right? Or super, yeah, or some superhero. Uh, Randy, Randy, if I may, real quick here. Yeah. Uh, what you said earlier that was profound to me that stuck in my head: uh, appearances, the appearance of our lives, born into the pride of life, sight of the eyes, lust of the flesh. The appearance opposed to the substance of the appearance, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're seeing it again right now in, in the cosmetic piece of what Christ may have looked like. <coughs> appearances can be glamorous in items or experiences or all that man's life. But the substance of each one of these categories is where the worth of the appearance really is. It's not in how attractive is it, it is to the sight of our eyes. It's what makes it attractive to us in the spirit because it's righteousness. That's a good point. And that, that goes back, I think, to Very my good. comment about truth. That when you when you find truth, you find the reality as opposed to the appearance. Uh, Satan is very good about false impressions, false appearances, if you will. But he cannot what he cannot do is to bring the reality to truth. Only Jesus, only God can bring us the reality truth. We can have appearance of truth, which is false. We can have the reality of truth, which is real and substantial. We have to end today. We have uh, exhausted our time and run over, I think, even a little bit. Um, so we. Uh, it was a good session, though. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, to God be the glory for, for all the comments you all have made and, and welcome comments. I appreciate that. Um, this is a time for learning for all of us. Uh, and, and we can only learn so much from one person. We learn when we all make the comments that are on our minds, on our hearts, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit will give direction to, to yes, the Lord. Not praise, me, praise not God. Doug, but the Holy Spirit gives direction to our lesson. Well, we're grateful for you guys and thankful. Merry Christmas to you, gentlemen. And Merry Christmas to all of our visitors by by phone. We appreciate having you here every week, incidentally. Uh, Doug, you want to discuss Thank you, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you, God Doug. God bless you. Let's close in prayer. Father, Merry Christmas. Thank, Thank you. you. Father God, we are so thankful for the time that you have given to us. We thank you that we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he came into the world to die for our sins. Father, we are so thankful for this gift that's uh, priceless. Father, it's indeed like a, a treasure hidden in a field or a pearl of great price. That, Father, uh, when we find it, we will sow everything we own in order to get it because we know the substance of it there is nothing greater and so father we thank you for what you have given to us through great sacrifice that you made in sending your son and that jesus did by enduring uh, being in the womb for nine months and then father going through a physical birth and then living a human life but living him a life that is perfect in order to uh, fulfill all prophecy about him. And that most of all, that he was willing to give his life as a ransom for sin. And Father, we thank you that you approved of that great sacrifice by raising him from the dead. Thank you, dear God. You deserve the glory and the praise and the honor this Christmas. And we pray that we will all bow down before you on Christmas Day and that we will praise you for your great sacrifice Amen. in Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.